it's a um, strange thing being asked to judge other people's work, especially when you know you consider yourself to be quite um, early on in your own career. And um, you know, I still, I'm still waiting for my ability to match my intention. Never mind judging whether someone else has done that. So um, I think that um, it's um, when you're reading the, the the strange thing is I've judged a few, a few competitions and um, that you you know the winner. It's a really strange uh, feeling, or at least for me anyway. So I read um, I think over 800 stories actually around and uh, and I knew. Uh, Louisa's story had won um, when the first time I read it, and um, and I won't, I'm not going to talk for too long, but I'll just tell you a little story about um, how much I love this story. We, I had read the first 300 when I was on a trip, and I came back and I read the next 500. And uh, when I got to the end, I looked at my long list and short list, and and um, when I reread those. Um, Louisa's story wasn't on it. Um, it's anonymous, and um, I couldn't remember the title, and so I knew it wasn't in the first 300. So I had to go back and start at 301, and hers was 581, <laughs> and I had to read them to find her story. So. Uh, that's how much that I loved your sh story um, because, you know, it would have been very tempting to spend that time in the pub or do other things, but <laughs> my conscience wouldn't allow me to do that because I, I, knew, I knew this was my winner and I don't know how I, got, I lost you, but I found you again. And, um, um, and that's, that's how uh, impactful a short story can be. Even in among 800 Others, you know, I knew her writing, I knew her style, I knew the story that she had told, I knew how I felt when I read it, and I wasn't going to stop until I find it again. So um, that's, that's um, again, the biggest compliment, I guess, that I can pay you about uh, your story. Um, I think, you know, you try to be really objective and you look at things very objectively. You say, you know, how, you know, you know is it, what, what are the best stories? You know, is a great right, you know, are they, can they use humour, um, is there uh, brevity, is there stuff that they've left out that says as much as what they've kept in, all of those things, you know. But in the end of the day, like, like Patrick says, you know, ultimately it's a personal thing as well, you know, like a, a, a judge uh, that chooses uh, one story one year and the next year that judge wouldn't, wouldn't choose it. And for me, you know, I like stories that are um, honest, and that I think, um, and I'll try to put this succinctly, it's, uh, I haven't quite formulated it uh, in a way that's uh, um, uh, sort of bite size, but um, I think that when someone, uh, an author is writing, you know, when you say, what is an author's voice, or how do you, how do you know, it's like, um, there's something going on beneath the words. It's not in the sentences, and it's not even in the story. I mean, it is there if you break it down in terms of what they choose to write about. You know, what their eyes see, you know, the vulnerability that they've witnessed, the degree to which they're prepared to, you know, um, strip away stuff about themselves and reveal their humanity in the story and um, through, what, through what their eye catches and what they've heard and what, what, what resonates with them and then what they choose to, to, you know, say to the world, this is me. But there's something going on beneath the words and it's like a, um, it's like the author is saying to you, here I am. You know, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna take you on this journey. You know, so come, will you come with me? I, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy um, or anything, but uh, you, you, it'll be worth it. This experience will be worth it, and you will have, uh, you will carry that, you will carry this away with you as part of your tapestry. Uh, you know, and, and I think great stories do that. And certainly for me, um, as, as Patrick was saying, you know, you judge the stories that, that you're given. And um, f with, with the story that um, it's, it's, it was part of me then, you know, that story. And I felt like I knew who you were. I think that as a writer, your intention comes out. And, uh, and I thought that uh, you had a beautiful intention. And I also thought that uh, you were, you know, honest and brave and funny and vulnerable, and, but um, smart. And um, yeah, so I loved it. And um, I think that's about enough of that, isn't it, really? Um, but
good. I think it was a very fresh story and it's very funny and, and I, clever and I really hope that you enjoy it as much as I do. Louise, Neilan, would you ever come up here and read the story and get me all <laughs> I'm aware that this isn't the Oscars, but I have a, a few quick thank yous. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank Paul McVeigh for going to so much effort to choose my story. Um, I've been spoiled rotten this week. Um, a hotel room, a double bed to myself, um, breakfast in the morning, an invaluable experience of taking a class with one of my favourite writers, Claire Keegan. Um, and I've also been taking strategic naps in between readings to accommodate the insane amount of free food and drink. Um, I never thought I'd say this in the career path that I've taken, but I'm getting too used to Prosecco lunches. Um, my thanks to Patrick Cotter, to Jennifer Matthews, and to Sophia, Pauline, and Mary for their overwhelming generosity and um, friendship. Sean O'Freelan once said of his home city, I would not have been born anywhere else. There is steel and cork. There is flint and spark of fire. There is endless challenge. There are many corners of cork that my homesick ghost will haunt. This festival is in part a celebration of O'Freelan's spirit that is still knocking around this parts of the, these parts of the woods and it's an honour to receive uh, an award in his name. I'll shut up and read the story now. <laughs> what feminism is. Our sweaty skins are stuck together in my single bed. I make myself smaller than him, sneak under his arm and trace the tattoos on his biceps. I ask about them and he gives me a lazy answer. He says he got them when he was young and stupid. They make no sense. Every girl he sleeps with probably asks the same. I have a compulsion to do something weird in case he thinks I'm boring, so I poke my finger in his ear. What the fuck? He stares at me while I roll around the bed cackling. The fuck do you do that for? I wanted to see how he'd react, I shrug. They all act as if they've been violated. I don't even go that far in. All I have to do is stroke the tiny white fuzz in the outside crevices, or maybe lean my little finger against the inside of the tragus. I like to watch their eyes for the moment of realisation. The hairs in his chest are smoother, more innocent than the curls in his head, all crispy from hairspray. I can picture him sprucing himself up inside the frame of a mirror, pursing his small mouth and flirting with his own eyes. Whenever I try to visualise men with no clothes on, they're mostly Ken dolls, but he carries himself so well that I could imagine it before I saw him naked. That's how I knew I was attracted to him. The sex is supposed to make me feel better. I close my eyes and wait for him to bash me into the corners of my head, but it feels like he's trying to shove a sleeping bag into the corner of a hot press and it keeps sagging and falling out. As the tempo of my breathing gains momentum in one ear, I hear my mother's voice in the other telling me not to look at him. A watching kettle never boils. <laughs> my eyes stay closed. I'm finally beginning to take my mother's advice. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of the phrases that are written under the red and white tear-off calendars she keeps on the window ledge of her kitchen and enjoys applying them to my life whenever I'm in the midst of an existential crisis. I pretend to enjoy myself until it's over and I get what I really want. A chance to fall asleep listening to the waves of somebody else's breathing, his arms wrapped around me like a bouncer guiding my dreams. He keeps fidgeting. I play dead, knowing that my only hope is to bore him into going to sleep. He jigs my shoulder and whispers loudly, and he chants with a few tins. Seriously? Yeah. I bend over and reach under the bed to fish for two cans of Heineken that have been rolling around there for God knows how long. He spanks my backside and I wince, embarrassed. We push open our tins and slope down warm suds that bulwark us from thoughts of the morning. He examines my collection of postcards and quotes I've scrawled on scraps of paper and blue tacked on my bedroom wall. This makes me feel more exposed than if I whipped the duvet off the bed and gave him a lap dance, but I'm glad he notices them. 
Why are there so many women writers who stop? He looks at me with his big brown eyes until I realize he expects me to answer him. I whip down the postcard of Heath Ledger playing the Joker in the dark night and hold over my face as a mask. Why so serious, I ask. He laughs. His desert island book is Anna Karenina. There's a quote from it stuck in the headboard of his bed. I was too drunk to read it the last time I ended back up in his house, so he read it out to me. There are no conditions to which man cannot grow accustomed, especially if he sees that everyone around him lives in the same way. He cracked open a can of fancy craft beer and said, it's good, isn't it? I wanted to ask if all translations say man and not people, or he and not they. I think it's ironic that in a story about the differences between men and women sleeping around, it's translated that way. I already know that I'm repeating unhealthy habits, but I get sick of being lonely and well-behaved, waiting for sexy Godot. I don't fit into his life, but I'll try anyway. An ugly sister masquerading as Cinderella, hoping he won't see my butchered feet. He plays along and says cute things, ramping up his sing-song Belfast accent and slagging my provincial one. I never described myself as being from down south until I moved here, and it makes me feel exotic. My family slag me off that I'm going to lose my accent, but if anything, I exaggerate my culture status because it makes people like me more. He throws his head back on the pillow like a dog howling to exercise his Republican alter ego. Do you accept euros? I laugh and he starts to tickle me. The tips of his fingers dig until I find giggles that aren't fake. He kisses me goodbye the way a happy husband pecks his wife before he leaves for work. I'm annoyed that he's leaving me alone with my thoughts, as if they're unwanted visitors I have to entertain by myself. As soon as he's gone, I roll yellow rubber gloves over the sleeves of my pyjamas. You can tell a lot about my sex life by looking at my bathroom. Within 24 hours of a one or two night stand, I'm attacking the enamel of the tiles with the same gusto a kid uses to scrub their teeth before a dentist appointment. I soak in the bath until my skin shrivels up, change into a fresh pair of pyjamas, dress the bed in new sheets and swaddle myself in a cloud of duvet with a cup of tea and the Kira Knightley version of Pride and Prejudice lighting up my laptop screen. By the time Elizabeth is walking across the field at dawn to meet Darcy, I feel clean again. Five days pass and he isn't messaging back. I tell myself that he's busy. My mother's voice wafts into my head like a draft. Patience is a virtue, have it if you can. I message him three, four, five times in a row before deleting the conversation from my phone. I see him again a week later. He is holding hands with his friend. She rests her head on his shoulder. We are at the launch of a literary magazine they have co-edited together. They are standing side by side like proud parents at a graduation, and I can't believe I shaved my body from head to toe on the off chance that he'd want me again. <laughs> he squeezes my shoulders hello as if to squash me back into the friend zone, and now I know how psychopaths are made. How are you, he grins. I'm great. <laughs> I smile to stop my lips from trembling. You're not bothered, are you? My gay friend asks me as we make our way to the bar. Of course I'm bothered, it's rude. I suppose, he said. But what's he meant to tell you? He's riding someone else. Yes, that's exactly what he's supposed to do. That'd be a bit awkward though. He pauses. Are you thick with me for saying that? No, you're thick with me. No, I'm not, just leave it. I'm angry with myself for losing the conversation when I clearly have the right to take the moral high ground. I look around the room and notice the girl he'd been flirting with the night he went home with me. She was wearing a white t-shirt which has a drawing of boobs on it, with like huge cartoon eyes with dots of nipples staring out of her chest. She has been published in the magazine. She has been published in every literary journal on campus, despite parading her mental illness around on social media. I think it's unfair that she's able to be both sick and successful at the same time. I want to hold him out to her like a mother in a shop and ask her to choose between them. <laughs> I nod in her direction. Emma Clark hates me. My friend rolls his eyes. Why? Because if I hadn't been there the night that he was flirting with her, he would have gone with her instead. 
I don't say that I'm glad he chose me over her. And she would be in the position that you're in now, so you've probably done her a favour. He realises what he said. What I mean is, you're overreacting. I feel like apologising to her, I say. Jesus. He squeezes my hand. Don't do that, pet. That's crazy talk. <laughs> he tells me to just be nice to the girl the next time I see her. I wonder if that's what feminism is. As the pints flow, I don my vigilante cape on behalf of the casually jilted women of Belfast. It isn't that I like him, I insist. I am happy that he is in what seems to be a, in a loving and caring relationship only days after sleeping in my bed. It would be, have been completely fine if he granted me the courtesy of letting me know. It would have been all gravy, I say, using the phrase that was considered cool among my school friends three years ago. I accost randomers in the queue of the bathroom to inform them of the offence committed against me. They rub my back and agree that men are bastards. <laughs> I brush up against them like a satisfied cat. I don't tell anyone about the nude pictures he has of me on his phone. I'm not half as humiliated about them as I am about the short story that I sent him that is sitting in his inbox, lonely and unread. My friend puts me into a taxi, gives the, fiver, the driver an extra fiver and shouts, make sure she gets into the house, okay? Then he slams the door. I wave the taxi man goodbye like he's a long lost uncle. <laughs> the next morning I wake up early and begin to wrap my thoughts around a story. I email the story to him, along with a note of explanation of proclaiming madness, fobbing insanity off as a quirky personality trait. The story could be good enough to publish, I think. I fantasise about reading it aloud at the launch of the next issue of the Literary Journal. I do a heel click on my way out to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, giddy at the thought of revenge. He messages back three days later. He tells me, with the composure of a priest, that he's glad I'm writing about it, but he can't fathom what would possess me to send it to him. <laughs> he's already apologised. He could have handled the situation better, and he should have said sorry without me having to prompt him. Most of all, he's pissed off at how I described the sex. <laughs> I don't understand why he skipped over the sheer amount of sex we had. We had a lot of sex, morning and night, and both of us were very much involved in that respect. I don't remember having that much sex. I blocked out the other attempts he made to knock the numbness out of me. The one time it worked and I felt the hot pain of nothing rising up in my throat, surfing on a wave of relief. I couldn't let him see me cry so I squeezed my legs together and rolled over. He threw a towel at me to wipe away the dampness down there. I used the corner of it to wipe away tears. My mind and my body have a silent understanding that if I ever get pregnant, I will kill myself. The process will be long and drawn out. I think I'll have the abortion first, unsex myself. I'll turn up on the doorstep of positive options like a lost child, hoping to make the idea of murder feasible. Then I'll get on the inconvenient flight to England, and after it's done, I'll wander around for a bit, bored and inhuman. I'll have nothing to do with this decision since I've lost control of my thoughts. Sometimes I make a half-hearted attempt to reassert authority over them, like a mother trying to find her misbehaving children in a jungle gym. Most of the time, it feels like there's not enough left to meet with, of me to argue with them. It has been two months since my last period. The app on my phone that keeps track of my monthly appointments informs me that I have a 40% chance of pregnancy. I started imagining my own funeral. I decided to read my story to a woman who my family pays 50 euro an hour to listen to me. My woman. That's what I call her if anyone asks me where I'm going on Saturday mornings. If I use the word therapist, I say it ironically with a wry smile and make a joke about being in a Woody Allen movie. She is a soft-spoken older lady who looks like she shops in Marks and Spencers and smells of talcum powder and scented candles. She always asks me how I am when I sit down in the chair opposite her and I smile and say, I'm grand, how are you? As if to trick us both into thinking it's a normal conversation. I read the story aloud from trembling pages. I'm nervous because I don't want her to think that I'm a slut. So I demote having sex to a kiss. <laughs> I've rehearsed the reading so many times that I skip over the words with the bravado of a kid who is good at hopscotch. 
The crease lines in her forehead bow in sympathy and she speaks to me in hushed tones as if I've suffered a bereavement. I was expecting this. She's being paid to take my side. I need more from her though. The wrinkles in her forehead scrunch together, crippling the lines of sympathy. I don't understand why you're relating your situation to feminism, she says, pursing her mauve lip, Clarence lips. I notice a white crust around the corners of her mouth that might be dry skin or toothpaste. Feminism has always struck me as a very strident position to take. I'm flushed and embarrassed, the way I used to be in primary school when a teacher corrected me. It takes me a moment to steady myself. I spend the rest of my 40 minutes explaining to, attempting to explain what feminism is until my time is up and she is forced to squash the conversation. She wraps up the vomit of my thoughts in a, dog, in a psychological rhetoric and gives me to take home to fish through later like a doggy bag in a restaurant. She opens the window, repositions the box of tissues on the coffee table and refills my glass of water so that the room is fresh for the rest of her clientele. I went to a poetry reading once and listened to an old man tell us an seal-proof narrative about the time he was lectured about women's rights by a 19-year-old student in the common room of a hostel in Prague. It was a funny poem. I remember laughing. He listened to her with the bemusement of a grandfather indulging his granddaughter in a wrestling match. He congratulated, on it. He congratulated himself on his performance. She didn't know that he was letting her win. Congratulations, Louise. And Paul, well done, boy. Great choice. Great choice altogether. Everybody here now is so lucky to have been among the first to hear that story.